Should we just... Yeah. <laughs> so Ads will just lead us in prayer now. Okay. Can, can you all hear me on the, this mic? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. We thank you we can only come because of you. We thank you you made the way for us and you desire that we come to you. You desire that we know you and that we walk with you. You desire to, to bless us and to show us things. Lord, you are so good to us and we come today to thank you. We come today to think about Jesus. We come today to remember your great love that knew no limit where nothing could separate us from because you chose to die for us and you rose from the dead for us. And Lord, we honor you today. We ask that you would bless this time of worship. We ask that you would teach us through your word and you would change us as we meet with you today. Amen. Amen. As we stand together, we'll sing the hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns. crowns the lamb upon his throne hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and hail him as thy matchless king through all eternity. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed o'er the grave, and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, which wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified, no angel in the sky can fully bear that sight, but downward bends each burning eye at mystery survived. Crown him the Lord of peace, whose power a scepter sways. From pole to pole that wars may cease, and all be prayer and praise. His reign shall know no end, and round his pierced feet. Their flowers of paradise extend, their fragrance ever sweet. Crown him the Lord of years, the potentate of time, creator of the rolling spheres, ineffably sublime. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise shall never, never fail throughout eternity. Please be seated, and Alex will bring our Bible reading. Good morning. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Our reading this morning is from 1 Kings, chapter 19, verses 1 to 8. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, 
so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then Elijah was afraid, and he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there at his head, a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Amen. Should we stand together for you? By grace alone. By grace alone, somehow I stand. Where once I would have feared to tread. In by did by redeeming love. Before the throne of God above, He pulls me close with nails gone hands into His everlasting arms. When condemnation, when condemnation grips my heart. And Satan tempts me to despair. I hear the voice that scatters fear. The great I am, the Lord is here. Oh, praise the one who fights for me. And shields my soul eternally. Boldly I approach your throne. Blameless now I'm running home. My oh God I come, welcomed as your own. Into the arms of majesty. Behold the bright and risen sun. More beauty than this world has known. I'm face to face with love himself. His perfect, spotless righteousness. A thousand years, a thousand times are not enough to sing His praise. Boldly I approach Your throne. Now I'm running home. By your blood I come, welcomed as your own, into the arms of majesty. 
This is the hope of celebration, knowing we're free from condemnation. your own into the arms of majesty please take your seats and I will now be led in our prayers and I can't remember if it's Carolee or Natalie but one of you working. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that we can boldly come before your throne, not because of anything that we have done or anything that we are, but because of your love. Thank you, Lord, that you welcome us with open arms. Lord, we may be coming very tired we may be feeling guilty. We may be feeling that we're not measuring up or that we're not worthy. We may be feeling joyful, Lord. We may be coming with certain needs. Lord, you know it all, and we lay it all at your feet. We thank you that because of your blood, we can be forgiven. Lord, we confess our sins. Thank you, Lord. You know each one. Lord, we give them to you now and ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your cleansing. And we ask for the feeling of freedom and cleansing that comes because of your blood. Thank you, Lord, that there is nothing that we could have done or that we do that your blood isn't more powerful to forgive. And we know, Father, that today is a new day because your mercies are new every morning. And Lord, we thank you that you give us hope because the chapter isn't ended yet, Lord. We thank you that we have a friend that is closer than a brother that holds our hands and will walk with us through today and through the following week and whatever it looks like outside, whether it's hail or snow like yesterday or sunshine today, that you are with us. And when the clouds are there, Lord, we know that the sun is still shining. You are still shining. You are there regardless of the weather, regardless of how we're feeling and regardless of what we face. And you have the future in our hands. You hold us in your hands. And we are just so grateful Thank you that you were there for Elijah when he was just worn out. And you are there for us when we are just worn out. And today, Lord, we lift you up because when we praise you and when we pray, they are the weapons you have given us to lift us up and to help us to go forward. And we praise you and we ask that you will open our ears to hear your voice this morning, that you have just that word for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Should we stand if we're able to continue our worship? Who else? Who else would rocks cry out to worship? 
whose glory taught the stars to shine. Perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing, but this joy is mine. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Who else would die for our redemption? Whose resurrection means our rise? There isn't time enough to sing of all you've done. But I have eternity to try. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Praise, praise to the Lord, to the Lamb, to the King of Heaven. Praise, for He rose, now He reigns, we will sing forever. To the King of Heaven, praise, for He rose, now He reigns, we will sing forever, with a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify Your name, You alone deserve the glory. The honor and the praise, Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Praise to the Lord, to the Lamb. To the King of Heaven, praise, for He rose, now He reigns, we will sing forever, with a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify Your name, You alone deserve the glory, the honor and the praise, Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand We bow down and confess you are Lord in this place. 
we bow down and confess you are Lord. In this place, you're all I need. You are all I need. It's your face I see in the presence of your life. We bow down. We bow down, we bow down, and confess you are Lord. In this place, we bow down, and confess you are in this is your all I need. You are all I need. It's your face I see in the presence of your life. We bow down, we bow down, we bow down, and confess you are Lord. In this place, we bow down and confess. You are in this place. So Lord, we pray that you would speak to us now. We pray that uh, Ian would speak with power and authority. Pray that he'd speak words of truth and wisdom. Enlighten our lives, Lord, empower us. Pray for our children too as they go to Sunday school, that you would bless them and bless their teachers as they deliver the truth. We pray, Lord God, that the truth will set them free, set all of us free, Lord God, from our concerns and worries in the knowledge, Lord God, that we are safe in your hands when we put our trust in you. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats and our children, you can go to Sunday school. Thank you, Alex, for that reading. And uh, I always seem to give Alex the depressing readings rather than the glorious readings. You take that echo down a bit. Or... Um, Elijah. What a man. What a man. If he'd written, he'd be the most well-known of all the prophets, but he couldn't be bothered. He was a man of action. He wasn't a man of words. But you look at him. If there was a league table, he'd be there, wouldn't he? Where would he be? One, two, maybe third place. I can't see him being third, can you? And then we have Elijah. And at the end of the Old Testament, the very last words of the Old Testament, I'm just going to read them to you because it just came to me as we were singing. We get these words. Behold. Remember, this is the last time God speaks for 400 years. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes, the rules I commanded him at Horab for all of Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Least I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. 
Elijah. And then when you flip through Revelation, there he is again at the end of the days, preaching on the streets of Jerusalem. Those last moments, hopefully we'll all be gone if our theology is right, will be gone. But the very last chance for Israel to turn to Christ, it's Elijah on the streets. And Christ, the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses, Jesus, and Elijah. Where did he come from? You know, he's not one of these prophets that we know the history of. All we really know is that Elijah stepped out of nowhere. He comes from a mountain town, a farming community. In 1 Kings, it says, Now Elijah the Tishabite, first reference of him in the Bible, of Tishba in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years, except for by my word. Imagine that. His first task, this mountain farmer, this giant of a mountain man, wanders down off the mountain, somehow finds himself in the presence of the king, presence of the king and the queen. And he doesn't bother with the small talk. He gets straight to the point. You've been messing it around. You've messed up Israel. Now there'll be no more rain not even due in the morning because of you. Get it sorted. And he walks out. Can you imagine that setting? Now, you know, we've all had the occasional false prophet. And they come in and they say whatever they want and everybody giggles afterwards. And they go home. We seriously go... <laughs> and I'm sure that's what went on. I'm sure they took, didn't take it. So it was that idiot who came off the mountains, said that, walked away. Nobody really cared. But three months later, how did they feel? There'd been no rain for three months. How did they feel six months later? No rain. We're talking about the Middle East, remember, here. We're not talking about Manchester without rain. We are talking where rain mattered. No rain. No rain for three months. No rain for six months. No rain for a year. Are they laughing now? They're thinking, gosh, what's going on? He just walks away, and God sends him to the brook at Cherith, and he leaves immediately. You do get that sort of John the Baptist kind of feeling about him. I imagine that court laughing at him. But the problem is, you see, six months without water, a year without water, and there's panic, there's hunger. No water means no food. No food means famine. <laughs> God, in his very first action, has sort of stamped his, what do you call it, vula. What's the word vula? Yeah, the stamp of authority on his words. He immediately has answered that prayer. And everybody in Israel knows that there was this crazy guy that wandered in, foresaw all of this, and nobody listened to him. And now they're thinking back, gosh, where is he now? God said, depart from here and turn eastwards. Hide yourself by the brook at Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook. The brook was fed by the springs. Good job there were a few springs in Israel. <clears throat> and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Just every, every, everyday thing. Oh, by the way, the ravens. Will, if I was going to start a Uber Eats or a you know, pizza delivery service, I would call it the ravens. And I... <clears throat> and they're going to send bread and meat by raven. Okay, well, it's not an average everyday thing, is it? When God feeds it with morsels delivered by the ravens and the brook fresh water, as time goes by, and we guess around about two years in, so he's been ha hanging out at the brook with the ravens for about two years. All of Israel's been falling apart. says that two years, while King Ahab and Jezebel had been looking everywhere for that darn Teshavite, Elijah no longer laughing now, angry and spitting blood. They couldn't find him. They were sending people to every corner of the world to find this guy, to have the curse taken off of them. And God suddenly says, things are getting a bit tough, Elijah. We're going to move you along. You know, you're going to have to leave the brook. It's drying up. Pop down to Zarephath and stay with my friend, the widow there. She's gotten up her room. 
And off he goes. There's famine in the land. No water, no bread. And the widow says to him, how am I going to feed you? It's about how much flour I've got and a little bit of oil. And what does God do? What does God do? He multiplies it. He does what he does best. It's all over the Bible. A never-ending supply of oil and a never-ending supply of water. Good for those of us that like carbs. Yeah? What can you do with oil and water and flour? Pancakes? Donuts? You know? But he supplies it. But it's not the first time, you see. You see, what we see here is a, it's a shadow. Who else was fed bread by miracle? Moses. And Jesus later. It's like it's one of God's little signs. I'm here, I'm doing this. And then just as things are going well, the whole country is falling apart and Elijah's eating well. And then what happens? The widow's son is ill. And it says he breathes his last. Let's look at Kings 17.7. 17, 17 to 22. And this son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You've come to me to bring my, son, my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him to the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought calamity even upon this widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself over the child three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. This is this young prophet. Now we've seen him, you know, a simple bringing back somebody from the dead. We've seen him three years without rain at the prayer. We've seen him being fed miraculously. This is Division One stuff. This is Manchester United at the best. This is really... You look at all those other prophets, but you look at the way that Elijah just bursts on the scene and the anointing that he's got. Elijah's walking on water, hitting a purple patch. Oh, I've got to ask. Do you know what I mean when I say purple patch? When I read this to my wife, she gave me a hard time. She didn't know what a purple patch was. And I said, everybody knows. So a purple patch is where everything goes well. And I say a classic purple patch was, I don't know, those of you that watch golf, in the year 2000, Tiger Woods won 19 trophies, 19 trophies. That's more trophies than he has won in every other year of his life so far. And he won it in one year. Everything went right. You ever had a moment like that? Yeah. Where everything is going well. Well, Elijah's having that kind of moment. Everything's going well. It's like whatever he does goes well. It's like Michael Jordan and that NBA final where the basketball comes from. And they're counting down five, four, three. And they've just turned over the ball and it's been thrown to him. And he's three quarters of the way down the court. He doesn't know what to do and he throws it over his head. Nothing but net championship. Because sometimes your confidence is so high and it's written. And it was written for Elijah. And sometimes it's written for you and me. The big one comes. God sends him. He says that he's, the son has come back to life. Everything's going well. And then God says, I'd like you to go back to Ahab now. How would you feel? You want to go back to the court of Ahab three years into the famine? He has to go back to Ahab. King. 1 Kings 18, after many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So he's going to get another sign from God. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine had been severe in Samaria. Fearlessly, 
Then we look at 1 Kings 18, 17, 20. Ahab saw Elijah and Ahab said to him, it's you the troublemaker of Israel. And the answer, I have not troubled. Imagine this. He's standing before the king. He's got to have been a little bit fearful. And he, the king calls him the troublemaker. And he says to the king, I'm not the troublemaker. You are. You, are, you have led Israel to following idols. You have broken all the commandments. It's you and your family's fault. And the Lord, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed Baal. Now, therefore, send and gather all of Israel to me at Mount Carmel. Who's in charge here? You want the rain back? You'll do as you're told. Now, little king, gather up all those prophets, 450 of Baal and 400 that sit at your lady's table of Asheron. Bring them all to Carmel and bring all of Israel as well. Carmel was the big mountain. And, you know, the thing about Carmel is you can see it from all those valleys that we've talked about before. You can see Carmel. But Carmel was a beautiful, fertile mountain with a plateau at the top. But after three years of drought, all those vineyards, you can imagine what they're like. So the whole of the eyes of Israel now turn to Mount Carmel. And they gather. The leaders of the tribes of Israel, the men of Israel gather there with 850 prophets who are worshipping other gods and who've led them astray. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets at Mount, ha Mount Carmel. <coughs> and we set up this fight. Elijah says, you can go first. We're going to see whose God is best. So off they go and they make their sacrifices, prepare their altars, get it all ready. And now it's a simple thing. If God is with you, then he'll take your sacrifice. Yeah? So they all start off, oh, Lord, or oh, Baal, or whatever they did. I'm sure it was with a lot of dancing and whoopla and smokes and mirrors. And nothing happens. The meat left on the altars of Baal and Ashra is untouched. It's untouched. And they go whoopee and wah. <clears throat> There's a flashing of lights and wacko dances and abracadabra and shazam and nothing, nothing, nothing happens. 850 false prophets failed to light their altars. And that's how it can be with false religions. When push comes to shove, in times of trouble, they don't work. It's as simple. They're good at the show, and they're good at the showmanship. But in times of trouble, they don't work. They come up empty. They lack content. Their altars remained unchanged. And Elijah, he reassembles the altar of Israel. Twelve stones, one of each tribe. And then just to rub it in, he pours water over the, the kindling, over the uh, offering, and over the stone. And he pours water over it just to rub it in. You know, you're without water and I've got plenty. And uh, not only am I going to bring down fire, I'm going to have water over it all. So much that a trench is around the altar. And he does it again. And then he prays. And then he prays. And fire falls from heaven. 1838. The fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering. And the wood and the stones and the dust and the water. Everything that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it. Can you imagine that day? Huh? You've got these clowns and they've been up and doing their stuff and nothing. And you're all standing there. And suddenly fire falls from heaven. Hits the offering first takes it untouched, and then burns everything else that's there. This wasn't just a little spark. This was the flames, the righteous flames of God. 850 false prophets. And Elijah says, seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And the people seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the book at Kishon at the bottom of the mountain and slaughtered them there. 850 false prophets met their maker that night. And their maker wasn't Baal or Ashra. And many saw who was the living God that day. Many chose to return to God. But not all. 
not even the majority. Because sometimes it doesn't matter what God does. We find it more comfortable to hold on to a lie than face the truth. And just to rub salt in the wound, Elijah prays. And he prays, Lord God, can we have some rain, please? And he prays it once, and he prays it twice, and he prays it three times. Now he's starting to feel a bit nervous. Four times, five times, six times. And on the seventh, a cloud appeared in the sky. And sometimes your prayers need to be consistent. They can't just be a one-off. I don't know why, but it seems that sometimes God likes to be nagged. He gets to the seventh and a rain falls. After three years, rain falls on Israel. Elijah was on the top of his game. God was blessing the people and the people saw it. He was God's man. His enemies lived in fear of him. And he never had a prophet had such a journey. Success, success, success. Guarded, protected, anointed by God. And then we get to Kings 19. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me more and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Fear sneaks in. Fear can come when you're at the top of your game. It doesn't have to come when you've done something wrong. It doesn't have to come because you're at fault. It comes to Elijah at the top of his game. Fear sneaks in. No matter where you are or who you are, fear can come. And it can annoy you in the small hours of the morning when you can't sleep. And it nags you. And he's afraid. The great man of God is afraid. And he arose. And he ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servants there, and he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat under the broom tree. And he asked. He asked God to take his life. After all that success, everything had been so good. You know the Frank Sinatra song? You know, I was riding high in April, shot down in May. And that's where he was. He burned himself out. He'd been doing so much. And he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and he slept under the tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said, arise and eat. And he looked up. And at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and he ate and drank. And in the strength of that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Now, I'm going to read you a poem. Is Helen around? This is a nod to you, Helen, because I can read poems too. <laughs> this is called Our Society. It's a short poem. This is the age of the half-read page, the quick bash, the mad dash, the bright night with nerves tight, the plane hop with a brief stop, the lamp tan in a short span, the big shot in a good spot, and the brain strain and heart pain, and the cat naps until the spring snaps, and the fun's done. Elijah's in trouble from success to depression. He is struggling, calling for God to take his life. He's messed up, he's depressed, discouraged, stressed out, burned out, and mentally strained, physically drained. Have you been there? If you got caught in that kind of downward spiral, often lows come after highs, and the highs can be great successes. I remember a few years ago reading, well, I think it was during COVID, you know, when you read everything? 
whatever was around the house because you had nothing else to do. You read it. And I read the biographies of Glenn Hoddle and Paul Gascoigne. Somebody given to me at some stage. The funny thing is, both those players at different times, after great success, tell of moments. I think Glenn Hoddle says it was three in the, mo three in the morning, the day that we had won the FA Cup. That's a big thing if you're a Spurs fan. Probably the last time they won anything. But um, Glenn Hoddle says, I sat down at home, the house was empty, the party was over. And I stared at the chair opposite me. And I thought, is there a reason to go on? Often lows come after highs. Beware that. And I've been there. I can remember looking out over a balcony in one of these sort of 20 story high uh, tower blocks, I guess. It was a 20 story high tower block with a, with a cafe at the top. And I can remember looking over that balcony and just looking how far down it was and what was going on. And I'd had a particularly bad time. Things were going really wrong. I was struggling. I sat down. <coughs> Whoever was coming to meet me never came. So I kept thinking along the track I was thinking. And that was a downward spiral. And I got to the point where I thought, yeah, and I remember consciously thinking, why not? And I actually stood on the chair. You can imagine me standing on a chair. It sort of stands out. I'm standing on the chair and I'm looking because you have to step onto the... And I'm thinking of stepping onto the railing. And then the phone in my pocket rings. The phone in my pocket rings. And I cannot leave a phone ringing. It's just something in there. I will, I will be rude to you and answer the phone. I'm sorry, but it's just something in there. And I stopped and I answered the phone. And it didn't matter the conversation because the moment had gone. When I sat down, I thought I could carry on. We all get moments, for whatever reason, when we have to face depression. Many of us have been there. And some may yet come to face that dark night. Elijah is exactly like most of us. The next to the last line of the poem seems to perfectly describe him when he speaks to the brain strain and the heart pain. At some point, if you keep on pushing, the spring snaps and the fun is done. And for Elijah, the fun was done. For, for a while, it seemed that modern society pushes you that way. You get pushed and pushed around. Take care of yourselves. Don't let society push you. Guard your quiet times. If you feel in any way this kind of depression, talk to God. Talk to the family, friends. And if someone talks to any of us, listen. You don't know what's going on. Listen. Our text tells us not only what happened to Elijah, it also describes how God meets him there. Elijah's distressed, depressed and discouraged. And after his great victory at Mount Carmel, I think he expected the nation to turn to the Lord. But when Jezebel threatened him, he cracked under the pressure and ran south. It was a day's journey into the desert, and he sat under that tree in utter dejection, judging himself a failure, and he prayed that God might take his life. Life can be hard. Relationships are tough, and thoughts like this are all too common. Do not think you're the only one you're not. Like Elijah, not one of us has not felt a moment when they wanted for sympathy. We've all had our lonely hours, our days of disappointments, and our moments of hopelessness. Times when our highest feelings have been misunderstood and our purest motives are met with ridicule. Days when our heavy secrets lie unshared like a cold ice on our heart. And then the spirit gives way and we wish that it was all over and that we could lie down tired and the hour would come when we could extinguish the lamp and welcome darkness because we are all made of the same clay. We make mistakes. We say things we shouldn't. We do things we shouldn't. We are cracked pots. Let's pay close attention to how God deals with a discouraged servant. We find it in the text. Elijah needed four things. 
There's four things he received from the Lord. I love this when God gets practical. Number one, he needed rest, refreshment, and recreation. Elijah sits under the tree, so discouraged, he prayed that he might die, and then he falls asleep. The Lord sends him an angel, and the angel touches him and says, get up and eat. Not get up and pray, not get up and read, not get up and have a chat, but get up and eat. And sometimes what you need is, what do we call it? We call it... Um, or something food, we say, like family food or comfort food, yeah. I crave, in days of depression, I crave my mother's roast. Sorry, Kat. She does a good roast, but my mother's roast. Because it bring, comes not just as a roast, it comes with memories. It comes with association. <clears throat> and you need it. And the spiritual advice is get up and eat doesn't say start preaching. He doesn't say get up and serve. The angel tells Elijah to go get something to eat. And here's a profound truth. We need to eat. Sometimes we need to sleep. Sometimes we need to eat and sleep even more than we need to pray. There is a time for everything. There is a time for crying out to God. And there's a time to roll over in bed and close your eyes and get a good night's sleep. There's a time when you can crave a chicken biryani or chocolate milkshake, or whatever it is for you. We need that sleep. We need that meal. We need to let our hair down and have fun. Remember, rest and recreation. For some, that means cycling. For others, hiking in the mountains. For some, it means a comfortable chair and reading a good book, or knitting with your friends. That's why God commanded man to work for six days and rest on the seventh. How are you doing with resting on the seventh? Hmm? God built into the fabric of the universe that we need to work and work hard and serve the Lord and also have some downtime. Do not forget that a Sabbath's rest is a command. We need rest. We need relaxation. And sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is to get up and cook yourself a meal, especially if you live alone. Make the effort. Cook yourself a meal because you'll feel better. And so the angel gives Elijah a specific command, get up and eat. He looks around, he finds the cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He eats and he drinks, and he lays down and he sleeps again. God's brave prophet, the man of God, is worn out. He takes a nap. He got up, he had some more food, and went back to bed again. He's well and truly emotionally, spiritually, and physically undone. Have you been there? Have you been that bad? I think most of us at different times in our lives have, and we don't like talking about it, but sometimes we need to share these things with one another because somebody's there for the first time in their life, and they are lonely. The angel of the Lord come back a second time and touched him and said, eat for the journey is too much. Strengthened by the food, he travels 40 days and 40 nights until he reaches Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave and did what? He spent the night there. Now understand, he's got all the, these kind of problems. We've not gotten to any of the real issues yet, but sometimes you've got to go deep into the issues until you deal with the simple things like hunger and physical exhaustion. Basically, God arranged for Elijah to have a six-week vacation. All expenses paid, all inclusive. Sounds good until you realize he had to walk across the desert by himself to Mount Sinai. 40 days and 40 nights. That's not a run around the block, is it? Mount Sinai was the place where you went when you needed to meet God. He didn't just pick out any mountain. He wanted to find a cave. And there were caves a lot closer. He went back to where Moses met the Lord. And when you're down... There's a value in going back to certain places. There's a value in going back to certain milestones in your life, certain physical locations in your life, places where you met God in the past, places where you laughed, where you felt good and loved, where you were safe and secure. If you're feeling down and things aren't going right, just go back to one of those places. Go back. The memory, the nostalgia, and slowly your heart will change. When you're depressed, there are three things that you need. 
and God made sure Elijah had them. Good food, good rest, and physical exercise. 40 days across the desert was great exercise. Sometimes just doing this gives you the reset that you need when you wake up. You have a new perspective. Things look better in the morning. And sometimes not. God's restoration of Elijah begins with rest and recreation. The mind, the body, the soul. And now he has to face his fears. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are, they, what are you doing here, Elijah? That's a good question. The last time we'd seen Elijah, he was winning the victory at Carmel. So what's he doing now, cowering in a cave hundreds of miles away? Not that the Lord didn't know the answer, of course. This question was not for God's benefit, but for Elijah. So explain yourself, son. You were my man up there on Mount Karma. What are you doing here? God is saying it's time to face your fears. This is Elijah's response. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broke down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. And everything he said was true. He'd been zealous. The people had rejected the covenant. They had put the prophets to, de to death. No exaggeration at all. If he'd stopped there, he would have been fine. But now look at the next sentence. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me. The last part of the sentence is not true. The feeling of being utterly alone, though, is. None of us want to feel that we are alone. The devil uses that one. He whispers it in your ear. You're all alone. Nobody's listening to you. Elijah needed an adjustment. He'd gone far too far into self-pity. <clears throat> he thought he was the only righteous man left in Israel. Sometimes we feel a little like that at work, in church, at home. We think we're the only one that can do that job. Let me stop at that point and make a simple application. Self-pity is the enemy of spiritual growth. As long as you feel sorry for yourself, you'll make a thousand excuses for not facing your own problems. and You won't get better. No self-pity. No blaming the wife. No blaming your colleagues. No blaming your parents. No blaming your inner tendencies. No blaming something that happened to you when you were a child. All of those things could be true. And sadly, they may be. But focusing on them, blaming the past, will never help you look to the future. If you start down the road, stop. I'll say it again. Self-pity is the enemy of spiritual growth. As long as you feel sorry for yourself, you won't get better. As long as you blame others, you cannot get better. And as long as you try to throw off problems on somebody else, you won't get there. As long as you say, as Elijah did, I am alone and left, O Lord. I am the only one who's faithful. As long as you talk like that, you won't get better. You may not be responsible for your past, but you must take responsibility for your future. Elijah did, and God stood with him. Third thing, he needed a new vision of God, a new touch from God. These things go together. Rest and relaxation speak to the body. Facing fears and self pity speaks to the mind. A new vision of God was needed for his soul. He needed to be changed, mind, body, and soul. And when Elijah begins to wallow in self-pity, God responds. Or more particularly, notice what God doesn't do. He doesn't say what many of us would say. You know, I've done it from time to time. What's wrong with you? Get your act together. We would have argued with Elijah and told him to snap out of it. Get a grip on yourself, man. God does not put Elijah down. He doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't ridicule him. God meets him at that point. And he says, come with me. Get up. Get out of the cave. Come with me. It's all God does. As we know, condemning depressed people generally doesn't work. It doesn't help us when we're depressed. If somebody condemns us, and it doesn't help us to condemn somebody else. It just makes the situation worse. What follows is amazing, though. A mighty wind tore across the face of the mountain, shattering the rocks. But the Lord was not in the wind. There was an earthquake, and the earthquake wrecked. And then a fire, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. F.W. Robertson, in his commentary on Elijah, says, and I'm going to paraphrase it, there are some who must go through tough times similar to those sustained by Elijah. 
The storm struggle must precede the small voice. There are minds that must be convulsed with doubt before they respond in faith. There are hearts which need, which need to be broken with disappointment before they can rise in hope. There are dispositions like Job who must have all things taken from them before they can find all things again in God. Blessed is the man when the tempest has set its fury on, recognizes his father's voice in it, its undertone, and he bows his head as Elijah did. Why does God put Elijah through this? God is getting his man back in touch with spiritual reality. Psalm 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. The Lord wants Elijah to know that it's not in the earthquakes or the fire or the huge events where we most often encounter the Lord. We more often meet God in the small and forgotten places. Stop complaining. Open your eyes. See how good God has been to you. Practice seeing God in the small things. Nothing happens by chance. We need to hear more from one another about those small daily testimonies of grace that got you through the day. They might seem small, but they're huge. God in heaven is touching your life. Our problem is we want to see those earthquakes. We want to see the fire. We want the big magic. We want the spectacular answer to prayer. And God says, that's not always where you're going to see me. Listen for the gentle whisper. God will always speak loud enough for the open ear. So, when you're down in times of trouble, that's a song, isn't it? Rest, refreshment, face your fears, a new vision of God. And now the final thing, a new job, a new focus with the same God. In verse 13, God repeats this question, and Elijah repeats the answer. There are times when a mistake must be corrected with accurate information, and now God does so. And God is going to give Elijah accurate information. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came across the desert. Go to Damascus. There's a long journey from the Sinai Desert through the Holy Land all the way up to the desert around Damascus. And he gave him specific instructions. The new job begins. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Avram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. Anoint Elisha, son of Shabbat from Abel Mahala, Mahala to, succeed, to succeed you as prophet. Just do these three things, you know, a king here, a king there, a prophet there. Jehu will put to death anyone who escapes the, score, the sword of Hazel. And Elisha will, be put, will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Jehu. Gosh, I guess they're going to cover one another's backs. And yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. God is reminding Elijah that he's not alone. And he was never alone. He just needed a new perspective. Not only was God with him, but God had another 7,000 who had not bowed down. He is not alone. Understand there is no spot in this world so lonely where God is not already there. God is not just to be seen in the big things. He's also to be seen in the stillness and the small things. God is not limited by our vision. In all this, God is reminding Elijah that you are not alone. I am with you. I've got 7,000 more just like you. And I don't know what's going on in your life today. But God is saying, you are not alone. I am with you. And I've got 7,000 more. Amen. Lord God, I thank you for the way you took Elijah off the mountains and changed the world. Lord, we, we thank you for your word and sometimes just how practical it can be. A simple story from the Old Testament relates to us even today. Amen.
Should we stand together? shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name. For my God is the ancient of days. Though the dread of night overwhelms my soul, he is here with me, I am not alone, oh, his love is sure, and he knows my name, for my God is the Ancient of Days. None above him, none before him, all of time in him. For his throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in his name. For my God is the ancient of days. Though I may not see what the future brings, I will watch and wait for the Savior King, for my joy complete, standing face to face in the presence of the Ancient of Days. None above Him, none before Him, all of time in His hand. His throne it shall remain and ever stand. All the power, all the glory, I will trust in His name. For oh, my God is the Ancient of Days. For oh, my God is the Ancient of Days. Please take your seats. We're going to share communion now. I don't know about you, but in my spare time, I flick onto little YouTube clips, which uh, sometimes can be amusing. And some of the clips that I've seen recently are um, about what churches did during Super Bowl in America to try and uh, make it Super Bowl friendly or to use Super Bowl as a theme. And I think the reason that they got onto YouTube was perhaps they went just a little bit too far. Is they had the platforms in green with the white lining of the Super Bowl uh, pitch laid out. They had uh, the ministers like referees with black, uh, black shirts on, swinging on wrecking balls. I didn't quite understand where that came from. <laughs> What they were trying to do was to make church relevant, I guess, and to make it uh, a place where people might feel able to come. But of course, it really missed the point because this is what God has designed. God has designed a place 
for us to meet together with him. And it's a reverential place. It's not a place where you turn up when you feel good enough. I think this morning you heard about a prophet who just felt about as though he had about enough and he was no better than his father's. But it's good for us this morning to examine ourselves reverentially in this unique place together. And however you feel this morning, if you love the Lord, he knows all about you. And if you think you've been bad this week, he might know some things you're not even thinking about. But he loves you. And he gave his son Jesus to die for you. Praise God for that. Praise God I'm paid for. It's all paid for at the cross. Paul had to write, write and remind the Corinthians. They gone. They turned it all into a party. Paul said, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us this morning just bow our heads and examine ourselves. We can remember our failures, and it's good to remember and to acknowledge the fact, as I will, that I've sinned and I've fallen short in attitude, things I've done, things I've not done. Let us commit ourselves to do the things that we should and to not do the things that we shouldn't do. And to ask him to forgive us with a humble heart because of the immense price that he paid to pay for our sins. I wonder if Tony, Daniel, Miriam, and Carolee, could you just join me at the